Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. I'm back, book lovers. I had a lovely couple of days away. I love traveling. I have missed it so much. Um, I had several purposes for this trip. I was focused on rest and relaxation, as well as facing my anxiety and fears about traveling alone, and also about driving in high traffic situations. And I also planned on writing and reading a bunch. So, what did I actually accomplish? Rest. I did sort of rest. The bed at my hotel was pretty rough, and I was pretty keyed up. I have never stayed alone in a hotel. Guys, I'm 40. Um, <laughs> this trip was long overdue. Needless to say, I had a hard time sleeping. Relaxation. Yes, definitely. So much relaxation. I went to the ocean, which is just so soothing for my soul. I swam, I walked on the beach, I read in the sunshine. I went somewhere new. I had complete freedom to be just M. And I like just plain old M. She's pretty chill. <laughs> Traveling alone was a big focus. I needed to be reminded that I am an individual with my own existence beyond the roles that I play as a wife, a mother, whatever else. <laughs> Was I anxious? Yes, very much. <laughs> Did I work through it? Yes. And I felt like I handled things um, that I expected to be stressful very well. I was super proud of how I handled that whole trip. I really let fear and anxiety run my life for way too long. And I feel like I confronted some pretty serious stuff on this trip. As far as reading and writing, I was not motivated at all to write. I had been in a really good productive flow before I left, but I think I needed to just take a break. Reading-wise, I read on the beach, which is one of my favorite places to read. And also during my trip to and from the ocean, I listened to the audiobook of She's Come Undone by Wally Lamb. So there are a few books that have very deep personal significance to me. Do you guys have any books like that? Mine tend to mostly come from the most turbulent time in my life. Books were always a comfort to me and honestly how I learned about the world. And they were an escape. When I was a kid, I would reread my favorites just over and over again. Recently, I decided to revisit one of these books. I tend not to revisit them for fear that reading them with, you know, different adult eyes would ruin the magic. But I knew I had to reread this one. Actually, like I said, I listen to it. I love audiobooks for long trips. Like I said, this was my first solo trip, um, probably in 20 years, but really my first like solo, solo trip. I've always gone somewhere to visit someone before, and this time I was completely on my own and just free of responsibilities, free to do what I chose, such as decide to drive three hours to the ocean on a whim. So I had lots of time to listen to She's Come Undone. And I kind of thought of this drive to the ocean as my own she's come undone moment, in a way. Oh, this book, I'm not entirely sure where to begin. It created or revealed some very base level things in my life. Um, my need for the ocean, the magic of the water and whales. As I listened to it, I realized where some aspects of my personality were formed during the reading of this book. I was a teenager when I read it for the first time, and though the ages are off, I related to this book so hard. Um, too hard, really. I was so much like the main character, Dolores, who is occasionally referred to as Dolores, Our Lady of Sorrow. Um, at the time, I really felt like uh, Emily, the Lady of Sorrow, so some things just hit too close to home. This book is about pain and Wally Lamb gets it right. In the book, Dolores plays Billie Holiday on a jukebox, and 
There's a comment about Billie Holiday and how she really gets the pain right. And I think the same thing can be said for Wally Lamb. Do you have to be broken to have your heart ripped out by this book? I have no idea. If you are more of a Jeanette character, Dolores' childhood best friend, and have read the book, let me know. Um, I had a Jeanette once, but I have definitely always been Dolores. I miss my Jeanette. During my trip, I drove through my hometown. I thought about her and the end of our friendship, which was mostly my fault. I almost stopped to see her. We're Facebook friends now, but I don't know. It was just strange. The past is the past, you know? Anyway, that's just one moment in the book that aligned with my life, and this book really messed me up. I felt seen big time, and really for the first time. Until then, I thought I was the only one that was broken in these ways. Really, it was also the beginning of my interest in psychology and the effects of trauma. The second time through this book has been really interesting. It changed certain pictures in my brain because my adult self understands so much more and I have a lot more empathy and compassion for others than Teenager M did. <laughs> like, for sure. This book is just filled with the grief of life and there is so much of it and how it can warp you if it's not handled properly. But it's also about survival, about handling whatever life throws in your face, and that even if you almost give in, you can still get back up again. Trigger warning, this book is intense. There is rape and abuse and suicide, but it is through the lens of a confused child, abused teen, and a mixed-up young woman. The ending is satisfyingly real, it's hopeful, but not romanticized in any way. Honestly, I think it's perfect. Recommending Wally Lamb seems sort of silly, but if you haven't read his books, this one is a treasure. I obviously have a teenager's attachment to it, but Adult M loves it for her own reasons. And he's just a masterful writer. Read anything by him. Wally Lamb is brilliant. Now it is time for a quick break. And then I'm going to tell you about my pet's reactions to my homecoming, and I've got chapter 30 of Heart of the Storm. Be right back. Welcome back, book lovers. Man, I was feeling the love when I got home from my trip. There's definitely something to the idea of absence making the heart grow fonder. I always kind of thought it was BS as a teen, but sometimes you have to go away so that you can be missed. Um, my animals definitely missed me a ton. Their reaction to me coming home was hysterical. First of all, my dog was overjoyed and would not leave my side. He whined when he got shut out of my room and he had to be just sitting pressed up against my leg. He's so sweet. He's also 115 pounds. <laughs> my big old baby. Um, the cats had varied responses. Sassers was super excited to see me. And she made sure that she was always nearby, but she didn't need a ton of direct attention other than the initial like, hey, you're home. Um, Zeus was a little standoffish at first, but that didn't last very long. And then he was back to his usual like lovey-dovey self. Edward was the most upset with me. He's definitely our most emotional animal, and he did not appreciate my absence. Uh, he's mainly my cat, and he ignored me for several hours after I got home. He would show up in a room just long enough to let me know that he was ignoring me and then walk away. He's a bit of a diva. <laughs> He's okay now, though, back to his usual spot on my bed, and he purrs when I pet him, so I am forgiven. Is there anything better than pets? The rest of the fam was happy I was home, too, but I find pets interesting because they could just be a wild animal, but they've chosen to live with us, and they also seem to really, truly love us. I don't know. Anybody have any funny stories about animals com and coming home? I'd love to hear about them. I'd also love to hear about times you've traveled alone and if you were a nervous wreck like me. <laughs> we get through it, though, and then it's awesome. <laughs> That's how we grow. Anyway, now it's time for the quote of the week. It's actually three quotes this time, all chosen after I got home when I was still under the fever of adventure. <laughs> 
But I definitely agree with all of these 100%. The first one is from Eleanor Roosevelt. The purpose of life is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer and richer experience. Heck yeah. (laughs) That's all I can say to that. The next one is from Henry David Thoreau. You must live in the present, launch yourself on every wave, find your eternity in each moment. Fools stand on their island of opportunities and look toward another land. There is no other land. There is no other life but this. We only got one. You got to make it. You got to make it good. (laughs) And then finally, from Ralph Waldo Emerson, life is a journey, not a destination. And that is so very true. Life is short, book lovers. You got to get out there and live it. But before you do, please check out chapter 30 of Heart of the Storm. It is coming along beautifully, and I am thrilled with this first draft. The weekly writing project has really helped me strengthen my writing practice, and I am just loving the results. So please enjoy chapter 30 of Heart of the Storm. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Francie matched her thoughts with her steps. Each one was a struggle because it took her even further into the darkness. So far the going had been uneventful. She easily caught up to Harper and Maz. They couldn't travel very quickly with Harper's chair. Maz had shown visible irritation with her appearance, but Harper drew off her strength. Their melded powers gave her renewed vigor, and they moved quicker through the mountain pass. Harper's glow grew brighter as well, and the going was easier for a while. Then they passed through a stone archway and into a cavern of horror. Francie bit down on her fist to stifle the scream that threatened to bubble up. Harper's glow mercifully dimmed with her shock, and for a moment they couldn't see. Then Maz clapped and the room burst into light. Silver balls swooped and swirled around the room and settled high above them. Francie's knees wobbled, and she staggered against Harper's chair. Harper wrapped her fingers around Francie's arm, and her nails cut into the skin. They clung to each other, and watched Ma's move in a slow circle, gesturing to the room. Every inch of space was filled with pods. They were at varying stages of growth, ranging from tight, dark pods to almost fully formed creatures. Creatures that looked very familiar. What is this? Harper asked. Maz smiled widely. My children, they said. I told you I made an army. They certainly had. Re had been only one of thousands. Francie had met one initially upon entering the forest. She had assumed it had also been Re, but it seemed there were many, many more. How many? she asked. Maz's smile wavered briefly. Then they threw back their head and laughed. Oh, who knows? They just keep multiplying. Have been for years. Of course, they don't live nearly as long as humans do. Not even close. Harper and Francie exchanged a glance. Maz furrowed their brow. No need to worry about my children. They're on our side. Maz snapped their fingers and walked away from the girls. Come on, Maz said evenly. These are still sleeping, but I have many that are now awake. Come and meet your cousins. No. Francie's brain was screaming. Her body resisted every step, but she was deep within the mountain and dreaded the thought of a trip back through the darkness. Once had been enough. There was Harper as well. She didn't seem to even remember Francie was there, but she couldn't leave her. They were sisters, after all. Sort of. Harper followed Maz eagerly. Her face had hardened and her eyes were dark. They shone with an unhealthy glow. It made Francie nervous. They passed through a larger tunnel. It was even darker than before, though how that was possible, Francie had no idea. The sound of their steps and the crunch of Harper's wheels echoed and the cacophony was disorienting. Francie lost sense of where Harper was, and she froze in the darkness. There were other sounds now. The sound of wings, 
hundreds of them, and the occasional high-pitched giggle. Oh, no, Francie moaned, and she dropped to her knees on the cold stone. She felt numerous small hands lifting her, and the cold air beneath her chilled her right to the bone. She was rising upward. The sound of many wings surrounded her, and then they all began giggling. The sound was maddening. Francie fought against their tiny fingers. I wouldn't do that, sang a soft, high-pitched voice. It's a very long way down. Another chorus of giggles followed. Francie's entire body stiffened. She wanted to struggle, but she held still and let them take her. There didn't seem to be another choice. A low rumble drowned them out, and their cackles receded. Francie would have felt relieved, but the darkness around her was shaking, and thunder crashed around them. With a deafening grinding sound, a split appeared above her. Francie gasped. She could see stars, and as the opening grew, the expanse of sky continued to be revealed, and a slim moon appeared from behind a cloud. She could also see two other dark shapes. One was person-shaped and unmistakably Ma's, though Francie had not noticed their wings before. The other shape was a dark mass against the glittering sky. Harper and her chair were being escorted by small creatures with wings. Ma's children. Francie turned to inspect her own entourage and was surprised to find them adorable. Each face was round with fat, pinchable cheeks. Their hair framed their faces with soft curls. In the moonlight, their skin looked grayish-blue and almost iridescent. They seemed to glow of their own accord. They were grinning at Francie. All of them. Their smiles were sweet, but she was still uneasy. She cast a glance downward, but she couldn't see far into the darkness below. The little cherub holding her feet shook their head and clucked their tongue at Francie. Don't look down. There's nothing to see. Francie didn't reply. Something in the child's voice made her blood turn to ice. She held perfectly still and watched the stars while they continued to move up and up and up. Eventually they cleared the opening, and they were suddenly out in the open. The sky extended all around them, and Francie had never felt so relieved and free. The horde took them to a nearby flat expanse of rock, and deposited Francie roughly on the stone. Harper was placed gently beside her, and Maz lowered themselves gracefully to the ground. Return home, children, Maz said with a wave of their hand. I will call for you soon. They nodded as one and disappeared back into the mountain. The rock returned to its original place, and then the night was silent. Maz stood staring out over the valley. From their perch, they could see all but the easternmost corner. Harper rolled forward, closer to the edge, and Francie reached out to stop her. Harper, she said softly. Her voice seemed to break a spell holding them all in stasis. Harper turned to look at her, and she seemed to be coming back from somewhere far away. Maz was watching them with a smirk on their thin lips. Their pale hair glowed in the sparse moonlight. They moved to the edge near Harper. Look out there, Maz said softly. All you see below us is our home. The valley has always been a place of magic, a safe haven. We must make it that way again. There wasn't much to see. The mists hung low over the valley. Buildings and treetops were visible above the cloud line, but the world was dark save for a dull orange glow to the south. That's interesting, Maz said softly. Harper leaned forward in her chair. That's the southern forest, she said. Indeed it is, Maz said grimly. And our allies. Looks like she has failed. Who? Francie asked. Maz grinned at her over Harper's head. Your cousin, of course. The girls stared at each other for a moment. But, Harper said slowly, 
That's too many. Maz stepped back from the edge and laughed bitterly. No family is simple, they said, and our bloodline is a complicated one. Francie rolled her eyes. Someone had more than one kid. Maz looked annoyed. Yes, Lazalt has a twin sister. Lottie chose to keep him and asked me to dispose of the other. I think she hoped that having a son would somehow taint the magic. She had some reservations. Lottie was always worried about something. Harper's face was blank. She sat perfectly still with her hands clasped in her lap. Francie noticed the wooden rigidity had moved up into the base of Harper's spine. Her face was pained and disturbingly pale. How did you dispose of the child? Francie asked. Her voice was hard, and she and Ma's locked eyes. That's no concern of yours. I just did as Lottie wished. She had reservations about that eventually as well. She claimed she found the girl. Said she had agreed to help. I assume she was working in the southern forest. By the look of it, she failed. The smug smile on Maz's face made Francie want to smack them. She was bubbling with rage, but she tried to control it. Maz was their way off this barren mountaintop. She would not let her anger doom both her and Harper. What exactly is the plan? Francie asked. I'm not clear on what we're doing or why we're here. Harper finally snapped back to reality. They need our magic, right? She asked Maz. To finish what you and the others failed to do? Maz rolled their eyes. You're as impossible as your mother. But yes, we do need you. Thea does as well, but for different purposes. And why are we helping you over my mother? There was a long, low howl from the valley. It traveled up to them on the wind, and Francie shivered. She told herself it was from the cold. Because I'm not the one who wants you dead. And that is the end of Chapter 30, Book Lovers. I hope you're still enjoying Heart of the Storm. Make sure to check out booksandcatspod.com for all things books and cats. Send me your book recommendations and funny cat stories. I would love to hear them. And thank you so much for listening. Until next time, keep reading.